please, comments, uh, criticisms, uh, what have you. Yes, sir. Yeah, what would the population be required to really get generic answers from all the people once? Right. It's very difficult to know. And the question was, what, what, what were the, generally speaking, what were the populations of the tribes during this period of time? It's very hard to pin down exact population figures for a number of reasons. First and foremost, the people doing the counting are the English, who very rarely have people on the ground taking census reports among Native people. And when they do try to come up with hard figures for Native people, they almost always do so in terms of warriors. Such and such a tribe has X number of warriors. So then what scholars try to do is extrapolate from that. And they say, well, on average, you, have, you usually have four to five non-fighting men for every warrior. Um, and we, we go from there. Another difficulty, by the way, I, I should note, whenever you ask a historian a question, they'll always say, well, it's very hard to say. <laughs> on the one hand, so let, let, let me uh, recognize that. Uh, another difficulty is, during this period of time, Native New England is being racked by what I think is fair to say is the greatest disaster in modern world history. And that's the introduction of epidemic diseases, especially from Europe and also from Africa, um, to the Americas. It's during this period of time that, the, that North and South America goes from being roughly one-seventh of the world's population, one-seventh of the world's population to a mere fraction of that. Um, mostly because of diseases like smallpox, which in some instances will wipe out upwards of 90% of a population in a matter of a year or two. That, that in fact happens around Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth um, just before the English arrive in those places. Um, which is to say that, that native populations during this period are under siege. Their populations are dropping, they're rising again, they're being afflicted again. All that said, when the English first arrive in southern New England, the best scholarly estimates are that somewhere in the vicinity of 100,000 Native people live in the region. 100,000 Native people. 50 years later, it's, it's about a quarter of that because of these, these epidemic diseases. And meanwhile, as, as we noted, the English population is, is growing like topsy. Um, so you have a radical shift in the balance of power over the course of a half century because of these population dynamics. On the eve of King Philip's War, as best we can tell, and the, again, the numbers are, vi are very, very um, uh, fraught, the Narragansetts probably had a population in the neighborhood of 10,000 people a mere fraction of what they would have had during, during uh, the early 1630s or the 1620s. And the English, uh, the English population, for, for, for that matter, um, was, was approaching 100,000 people. Yes, sir. Yes, um, after the height of, the, uh, of King Philip's War, after when uh, King Philip and all of his ally, all the other allied tribes were attacking all these uh, major townships throughout Massachusetts, uh, northern Connecticut, in yep. the proximity of, yep. of um, Simsbury, and so forth. Um, now, the reason why they didn't, um, you know, attack during the winter, I mean, December, uh, uh, late 1675, early 1676, it, when the English decide to then um, respond to their assaults, is because, I mean, naturally, uh, Native warriors often attacked during the warmer months. Is that correct? Yes, because because of the foliage cover. Yes. Yeah, they, the, the general native uh, tactic are guerrilla strikes, or when they're launching a concentrated campaign against a town, they will take cover during the during the evening or the dusk hours, and then when sun the sun comes up, they all strike at one time. It's very hard to do in winter. Yes. Um, th that's one reason. Another reason that the campaign, uh, the native campaign, peters out during the winter is that most of the, uh, the native uh, combatants had moved all the way to the vicinity of Albany. And the reason that they're doing that for two reasons. One is, now as Julie noted, by, by King Philip's War, the English have conquered New Netherland, and New Netherland is now New York. But Albany is still a Dutch town. It's all Dutch. It's under English jurisdiction, but it is a Dutch town. It, that's the, the arms entrepot. For, for native people. So they are in the neighborhood of Albany acquiring guns, powder, and shot for the warmer months. 
they're also in Mohawk country, and they are they are working they are working overtime to try to draw the Mohawks into this conflict on their side. It doesn't work. The the real turning point in King Philip's War, as Nenegret probably could have predicted, was when the governor of New York and the Mohawk sachems make a pact in which the Mohawks attack the southern New England Indians outside of Albany, driving them away from their arms trade and back into the teeth of the English and allied Indian uh, war effort back, back in southern New England. That, that is the key turning point in King Philip's War. Nineveh always knew the Mohawks are in the key to regional politics here, and it certainly proved true uh, during King Philip's War. Yeah, no one, no one looks terrified when we say obviously Mohawks today. So it's hard to recapture that. But at the time, when English talk about these English writers will talk about Mohawks, they they're terrified. It, they really are scared. And so anytime they see a Mohawk somewhere, they always note it. And so that's why Ninigret uses the Mohawks so conspicuously is because the English absolutely were paying attention to their presence. Yes, sir. You've given a lot of information uh, from your interpretation of what happened. And you also, in the beginning of your speech, said that the Indian interpretation is different. Not to go through another big explanation, but what basically is different from the, uh, the, in the uh, Indian interpretation of what went on? I don't think either one of us would dare to try to, uh, to speak. Um, I, first of all, I don't know whether there's a consensus in Narragansett view on this. That's, that's the first thing. We've heard a number of different takes on, on Narragansett from Narragansett people who have come to our talks. I think it's better to ask them to come and speak um, on, and on their perspective on, on Narragansett, and I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure they'll, they'll have a very different uh, take on it. Uh, but I think we'd be overstepping our bounds if we claim the right to speak on behalf of, of, of them here. Would you, would you agree? I feel our hands are full with one, <laughs> with one, with one story. Um, I, you know, I, I, I do think, yeah, let me, and, and let me say this, and I think this is, this is a critically important point. Um, the field of, of Native American history is a relatively new one. As a professional field of study, obviously there's always been Native American history, but as a professional field of study, it's decades old. Not centuries old, it's, it's, it's decades old. It's also a politically fraught relationship, uh, because very often what you have is non-native people like ourselves speaking about topics that are near and dear and sensitive to native communities, um, and giving interpretations that very often don't jive with those of the native communities. At the same time, most native people whom I, who, to whom I've spoken want to see more Native American history being taught and talked about. So there's a lot of tension in all of that, and for scholars like us who are working in this field, we need to be as sensitive as we can um, to those sensitivities um, while also pursuing our discipline. After the Narragansett War, how many Narragansetts were left? And were most of the Narragansetts now basically Niantics? There's no way to know how many Narragansett survived. And, and, go ahead. Let me please. And, and this is for a reason. So, right. so following, following the war, because the Narragansetts had subjected themselves to the king, the English argued if you were subject to the king, then this was treason. The English government does not treat treason lightly. So the punishment for so many, any Narragansett warrior that was accused, they were hanging them, executing them, selling them into slavery. They had every reason to keep low, stay quiet, even if they weren't involved. And there's, you know, there's trials going on where you're seeing um, in, in Rhode Island, um, in Providence, where they have a jury who's convicting one after another men to death, and their wife and children are being sent to Sugar plantations. So Barbados, Jamaica. Yeah. This is why it's Bermuda. hard. This is why it's hard to get those numbers because it's better. To, it was better for survivors to just disappear. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. But let, 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 let's just uh, put a, a to punctuate that point. Even Roger Williams is dealing in Narragansett slaves after King Philip's War. This is how embittered the people of the region, native and non-native, have become. Rod, Roger Williams was a friend of the Narragansetts for most of his life, not after King Philip's War. He is dealing in native slaves um, after after that period. Now, after King Philip's War, you can speak of what might be called an Algonquian diaspora. 
as the survivors do the best they can to piece together their lives. Some native people from southern New England flee to the Catholic missions of New France, and they, they find refuge there. They find refuge, they find trade, they find, they have, they're among allies, among the Abnakis of, of, of northern New England. For them, King Philip's War isn't over, and in the French-English Wars, which stretch from the late 17th century and the 18th century, the descendants of southern New England Indians living among the French are routinely attacking down the Connecticut River Valley. This is part of the same war for them. And memories last long here. Others are fleeing west and, and merging into Muncie and Delaware groups um, in, in the Hudson River and the Delaware River Valleys. Many others lived short lives in slavery. The, the English sell at least many hundreds and probably a few thousand natives from southern New England into slavery among the sugar plantations, which, which are, you know, they just, they consume labor with a fury uh, during this period of time. Um, and there, so there are native people scattered throughout the Caribbean from southern New England uh, during this period of time. Um, others merge into local groups. Um, in terms of, what do they become Niantics? Again, you might want to talk to the local Narragansett people about this issue, but here's what we see. The Niantics are a close affiliate of the Narragansett people. Are they tributaries? We don't know. There's no record that says they pay tribute to the Narragansetts. They're, much, they're a small group. The Niantics are small. The Narragansetts are large. Um, what the Narragansetts say is, they're our kin. Like, they're, 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 we're close confederates with them. And eventually, Nenegret establishes a reputation as not only a Niantics agent, but as a spokesman for the Narragansetts. So he has, an he has a foot in, in both communities. The Niantics eventually become known as the Narragansetts by the early 18th century. Um, why that happens? It, there's, as a, a historian working with documentary evidence, we don't know. No one says. It just happens. Could be because they absorb Narragansett people. Could be because they're in what the king called the Narragansett district. Um, it, it's it's hard to know. Yes, ma'am. What do you draw your um, expertise from? Mostly from English documents, or um, where where do you get your information from? Let's start with that. No, it's a great it's a great question because, and especially for this period, I know sometimes people may think, where did they get that? And then you find the document. Um, we get them from a combination of personal letters. So yes, a lot of a lot of English, primarily English sources, in terms of letters they write, court records, town records. You'd be amazed what's tucked into town records. But we also go further than that. We also look at archaeological records, and Dutch word? Dutch records. Um, there's even some French. Um, and yeah. I, I think it's important to note here. I think um, very often people will take a an oversimplified view of the historical record, and they'll say, well, you have an English and English perspective and an Indian perspective. If you got nothing else out of this talk, I hope what you'll see is that there are not two monoliths facing each other in southern New England, that the English camp is fractured into many different um, um, configurations, as is the native one. What that means is we've, we're often drawing on documents from six different colonies, some of which hate each other. But Rhode Island and Massachusetts hardly share a perspective on anything during, uh, during this period. Likewise, Rhode Island and Connecticut. Dutch New Netherlands certainly is not in agreement with the United Colonies of New England. So even though their Indian voices are very often lacking, um, we have them in snippets, and we try to share those with you, um, we do have these conflicting colonial records which help us get a more layered perspective on these events. But look, a lot is missing here. A lot is missing here. You, you, you guys have all, uh, heard um, uh, many times in your life uh, historians bemoaning the story of the great white man. Well, when you're doing Indian history, it's easiest to tell the stories of the great Indian men. It's always the great men um, who are easiest to tell. They're the most visible people. But Nineveh is at the top of the social hierarchy. We don't have the perspective of common native men. We don't have the perspective of half the population, which is female. It's very hard to say anything um, of value about native children 
during this period of time, the record takers don't pay any attention to those people, or very rarely do they pay attention to them, them, which is why we're telling a story that's focused on politics, because that's what the record reflects. Uh, there are many other things going on in Indian country during this time. We only could wish we could do it, but we're historians, and we can only work with the materials at hand and try to be as savvy and entrepreneurial as we can about it. I mean, one thing, what makes New England incredibly special to work with, however, is beginning in the 1660s, they're few, but there begins to be Indian authored documents. We have them in both English and in Wampanoag. Yeah, that's right. So, for instance, there's one letter um, that went into this book that's written by John Sassaman, and if the name doesn't, um, if the name doesn't ring a bell, it's his murder that is one of the precipitating events of King Philip's War. But he's an interpreter and scribe before he's a, a case. He went to Harvard College. And yes, he went to Harvard, he knew how to write. Um, so, mm -hmm. and then actually during King Philip's War, there are letters coming in, if you're familiar with Mary Rawlinson, um, who was taken as a captive, there are letters coming in who are brokering her release that are from native authors. And they're writing it, not through a translator, right. it's, it's themselves. Right. So New England is, is so special that way. And they're, they're far and few between, but when we get them, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's a big aha in the archive. We're yeah. so excited. Th these letters we should mention, are, they're an outgrowth of missionary work, um, which is it's not focused in, in this neck of the woods, in no small degree because of Nineveh, who would not tolerate missions, missionaries working among his people. Mm -hmm. For that matter, this is interesting, neither would Uncas, who was a friend of the English, but not when it came to missions. Nineveh and Uncas can see the, the missions are a first step towards um, uh, English jurisdiction creeping in. But you do have a, it is a thriving uh, missionary effort uh, stretch around Massachusetts Bay, stretching down the Cape and the islands, and then working its way, and this is one of the causes of King Philip's work, working its way into central Massachusetts around modern day Worcester. Um, on the Cape and islands, where the mission was most thriving, um, in the late 17th century, a third of native men could read in Wampanoag, and a fifth of them could write. And most of them are being taught by that time, not by the English, but by other na native teachers. Um, it's, it's an incredible, it's an incredible uh, development um, in, uh, in New England history, and it's distinct in the broader colonial story. Was it Latin script? Was it transliterated into Latin script, or did it have its own script? They, they start writing uh, Wampanoag in, Rome, in Roman letters, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is, wow. it's pathway. It's and it's because of that corpus that the Wampanoag language is being revitalized today yes. in Wampanoag communities. Um, it's one of the ironies, is that the mission is a wedge for English encroachment and native dispossession. These days, though, Wampanoag people are using these documents that were part of their exploitation to revitalize their language, which is, of course, a pillar of, of their, their identity. It's, I've got a, one final note. And so you think when you get, oh, well, if we can get native author documents, it's all going to become clear. And then you get it, and it's complicated, and there's right. politics, and <laughs> you realize right. every document's complicated with a perspective and a bias. And so there's no such thing as this beautiful document that's transparent. They're all complicated in great ways. <coughs> Other comments or questions? In that case, we have a, a handful of books. If anyone is interested in uh, purchasing them, they're 20 bucks a whack. We'd be happy to, uh, to sign them for you. Otherwise, thanks so much for your Thank attention you so and your, your How do you do? Sandy with a Y. Sandy with a Y. Nice to meet you, Sandy.